What comes to mind when you hear the name Nebuchadnezzar? You will instantly associate the name with wickedness, if you are a Christian or Jew who is familiar with the Bible or the Torah. He was one of the kings who invaded Israel at the time and imprisoned a large number of Israelites in Babylon. You will recall his interactions with Daniel and even his dreams, which served as a global prophecy. You may even recall him eating grass as a form of atonement from God, among other repulsive deeds. You won't likely say anything flattering about him, in my opinion. In this video, I'd like to share a different Nebuchadnezzar tale that isn't even mentioned in the Bible. Yes, between 1121 and 1100 BC, Nebuchadnezzar I, also spelled Nebuchadnezzar I, ruled as the fourth king of both the second dynasty of Isin and the fourth dynasty of Babylon. He ruled for 22 years and is listed as the most notable king of this dynasty in the Babylonian king list C. He is most well known for his victory over Elam and the recovery of the Marduk cult idol. He is not related to Nabuchodonosor II, also known as Nebuchadnezzar in Hebrew and the person you are most likely familiar with from your Bible, who bears the same name but lived in later history. It is therefore anachronistic but not improper to use this designation for the earlier king because he is not mentioned in the Bible. In the Chronicle of the Reign of Amu Miyukin, he is mistakenly identified as Erichtiakamuna's brother, most likely in place of Ninurtikuturyur I. The two different kings, the one from the Bible and the one from Babylonian history, are perpetually confused as a result. Now that I think about it, only his son in Lilndinapli, brother Marduk Ndine, and nephew Marduk Pixri were even acknowledged to have ruled during their dynasty. Therefore, the second Nebuchadnezzar mentioned in the Bible was in no way related to him. Of course, the first Nebuchadnezzar succeeded his father Ninurtandin Umi to the throne. The Enmejarenki legend, also referred to as the Seed of Kingship, is a Sumerian Akkadian work that details how the god Marduk gave him perfect wisdom, known as the Nam Kuzu, and it also makes mention of his claim that he is an offspring of Enmejarenki, king of Sippar, and that he comes from a remote line of the throne from before the flood. The opening of the seed of kingship is a lamentation of earlier happenings. At that time, during the rule of an earlier king, circumstances changed. The Lord was furious when good vanished and evil appeared. He gave the command, and the gods of the land disobeyed. Crime was encouraged among the populace. The guardians of peace fled to the dome of heaven in a fit of rage, who defends living things, and the spirit of justice stepped aside. The people fell to their knees and resembled those who have no god. The Namtar demon invaded the cult centers and overran the entire nation with other evil demons. The land's fortunes changed as its population declined. Because the evil Elamite did not value the nation's treasures, his battle and attack were swift. He took the gods hostage, desecrated the shrines, and left the settlements in ruins derived from the seed of kingships lines 15 to 24. Although the length of Nebuchadnezzar's war with Elam, for instance, and the number of campaigns he launched are unknown, it is conceivable that this was a protracted conflict with a variety of strategic factors. Nebuchadnezzar waged successful wars during his reign as king of Babylon. A later literary tradition claims that his army's exposure to the plague and his narrow escape from death in the stampede to return home prevented an invasion of Elam. A successful campaign is indicated by a raid, or Ayu, in a Kaduru created in his honor. During the hottest part of the summer, known as Demuzi, when the axes were held in the hand ignited like fire and the road surfaces were blazing like flame, he overran Elam in a surprise attack launched from Dr. the Kassite chieftain Idi Marduk joined him in this raid, dealing their enemies the fatal blow. There was no access to drinking water, and the wells were dry. As the power of the strong horses diminished, even the strongest man's legs started to sag. He was a king who was preoccupied with expanding his kingdom and winning wars one at a time, as you can see from his story. 
The excesses and other frivolities of the King Nebuchadnezzar in your Bible are not something he has time for. The Kuduru also assert that Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Elamite king Ultaludianwanak on the banks of the river Ulaya in a battle so fierce that the dust from it made it difficult for them to even see their way out of the battlefield. A different Kuduru claims that Nebuchadnezzar was able to recover the statues of Marduk, also known as Biel, and the goddess Iel Lea, also known as the Dinger.Uruia, during one of his campaigns. However, no earlier or contemporaneous source mentions Nebuchadnezzar taking the city of Susa. For the ancient Babylonians, these deities held a special place in their religion. The victory of the campaign was comparable to the siege of Troy for the ancient Greeks in that it reduced the city of Elam to helplessness and provided the Babylonians with a formative experience. The Marduk prophecy made mention of this well-known victory which was celebrated in poetry and triumphal hymns throughout the Babylonian dynasty. Nabuchodonosor Ur and Marduk, one of two hymns that extol Nebuchadnezzar's military prowess, recounts the fabled account of his recovery of the statue of Marduk. Beautiful Babylon traverse your heart, says the poem. The poem begins with the king weeping over Marduk's absence, telling him to turn your face towards your temple Asajala, that you love. Nebuchadnezzar gave Marduk the hymn rather than Ashurbanipal, who also defeated the Elamites, for stylistic reasons. He is the subject of a poetic pseudo-autobiography, though it doesn't actually use his name. An interlinear Sumerian Akkadian text describes the events leading up to the statue's return from Elam and its joyful installation in Babylon. A 7th century astrological report alludes to predictions made during his rule and their relationship to his destruction of Elam. You must realize that at that time, the Babylonian kingdom was the dominant power in the world and was deeply involved in numerous wars aimed at annexing new lands and capturing other kingdoms. Therefore, if you have continued to watch this video to this point, I applaud your commitment to expanding your knowledge of history and learning new things. Nebuchadnezzar, you see, made an entente cordiale with his contemporaries, making friendship for greater good and benefits with the Assyrian king Orarii I, and this union subsequently resulted in two military campaigns that he launched against the border forts of Zanchi and Edi in defiance of this agreement, as described in the synchronistic history. The first, however, was halted by the arrival of Orarii's main force, which forced Nabuchodonosor Ur to abandon his offensive plans and flee, whereas the second culminated in a battle in which the Assyrians massacred the majority of his soldiers and took their camp. Even Karatu, the field marshal of Babylon, was captured, according to the text. Despite being a Kassite chieftain and ally and having killed the formidable Lulyabu with his weapons, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to in the Idi Marduk Kuduru texts as the invader of the Amorite lands and the despoiler of the Kassites. Inscriptions discovered on bricks from the Temple of Enlil in Nippur that were used to construct the Ekitu Eagle Tila, Temple of Adad, in Babylon, honor Nebuchadnezzar's building endeavors. The Enlil throne for the Ikarijigal in Nippur was built by him, according to the later king Simbaripak. A late Babylonian inventory also includes a list of his gifts of gold vessels to Ur, and between 555 and 539 BC, Nabonidus looked up his steel for the Ntu priestess. The original Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar I, was a man of many talents during his lifetime, and I can tell you that for free. The earliest of the three remaining economic texts is discovered in his eighth year. Along with three Kuduras and a memorial stone, these are the only current commercial or administrative documents. The other Kuduru attests to a land grant to the Nyaku of Nippur, a specific Nutkuibni, in addition to the two Elamite campaign-related deeds. His name is engraved on four bronze loris and daggers, and two more bear a prayer to Marduk. It's possible that he is the Nabuchodonosor mentioned in the Chronicle of Market Prices, which details his ninth year, despite the lack of context. The sage who served him and the succeeding king Adadapladina, when he would compose the Babylonian theodicy, is also mentioned in the Uruk list of sages and scholars as Agilnamubbib, 
who is known as the Amun. It is believed that a number of literary works written in both Sumerian and Akkadian date from his era. According to Lambert, Marduk may have been elevated to the top of the pantheon, taking Enlil's place, and the Enuma Eli may have been composed during his reign. The Enuma Eli, according to some historians, actually dates back to the earlier Kassite dynasty. A text on chemical processes, and imitations for precious stones is still listed in his library, despite having a colophon stating that it is a copy of an older Babylonian original. Thank you for watching.